It's great to see all of you here tonight, and uh, we're coming to the close of Ruth, page 285 in your Bible there in the back of the pew. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, for such a time as these days have been with us uh, in the past few months, I've thoroughly enjoyed the book of Esther, but when you come to the book of Ruth, Ruth to me four chapters long. It's many, but it's mighty in its message. It's an incredible ending to a wonderful story, and certainly here at Christmas time, uh, I want us to look last time in chapter three, we looked at Boaz and Ruth at the threshing floor and what that meant and how that Naomi, the mother-in-law, she took charge to help Ruth um, to realize that she had to be the one to claim the kinsman redeemer. And tonight, whenever you come to chapter four, there are four different things we're going to look at here tonight. We're going to look at the bridegroom, we're going to look at the bride, and we're going to look at the baby. The bridegroom, the bride, and the baby. The book of Ruth opened uh, in chapter one with three funerals but it closes with a wedding here in chapter four. There's a good deal of weeping that is recorded in those first, in that first chapter, but the last chapter records an overflowing joy in the little town of Bethlehem. And I don't think it's by chance that we began studying the book of Ruth at this particular time, the Christmas time, the time that we sing about O little town of Bethlehem. In fact, in the book of Psalm chapter 30 and verse 5 in the King James Version, it says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, not all of life's stories that you and I encounter have this kind of a happy ending to it. But the little book of Ruth reminds us that for the Christian, God still is writing the last chapter. He still writes the last chapter of our lives and what is happening. So we don't have to be afraid of the future. In fact, just today, I was reminded of these scriptures. So oftentimes, I hear families who struggle with making all kinds of um, medical um, decisions for their family members and uh, should I do this, should I do that, should I have done this, should I not have done that, and uh, life seems to get complicated uh, with all of these decisions that we make at various times and then we question many times our decisions, but if you'd like to jot down these four passages that I'm going to give you tonight, I think it answers the question not only in the book of Ruth for you and me, but it answers lots of our questions today in Job chapter 14, verse 5 in the New King James uh, translation. Martha doesn't have these, so these won't be up on the screen. Job chapter 14, verse 5 in the New King James. Since the days are determined... The number of his months is with you. That word determined has the idea or the thought of being chiseled in stone. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. I like this verse in the book of Acts. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And then Psalm chapter 139, verse 16 in the New King James, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. And then in Psalm 31, 15 in the New King James, my times, King David said, are in your hands. So 
for the decisions that you and I have to make oftentimes in life where we struggle with those decisions of, did I choose the right hospital? Did I choose the right medical professionals? Did I choose rightly with going with hospice? Did I choose rightly with going with palliative care? Or whatever the issue may be, go back to these verses and uh, memorize them. Keep them at the heart of everything that you do because he, not us, has determined our days, our steps, our bounds. And they're all in his hands. And uh, today when I was reading that in the book of Acts chapter 17, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined. Remember that determined, it uh, gives the idea of being chiseled in stone. Their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Tonight, as we turn our thoughts to Ruth chapter 14, I want to read verses 1 through 10 to begin with, and I want to speak about the bridegroom who is none other than Boaz, but in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 4 of the book of Ruth, we find these words, now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. In a few minutes, we'll speak about the gate. In those ancient times, in those ancient days, they didn't go to courthouses like you and I go to to settle disputes and to hear court cases and to make decisions. They would go to the city gate where the entrance into the city, so many of the cities were walled, and they'd go to the gate. As people entered the gate, it was there that the elders of the land and, and those that were in charge, they uh, settled disputes. They took on whatever the situation, whatever the circumstances was, and it was at the gate of the cities where decisions were made. They held court. And those, those places. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. Notice the rest of that. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And notice what that friend did. And he turned aside and sat down. We're not even told who this next of kin was, that was a nearer kin than Boaz in the family of Elimelech. But verse number two tells us, and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Now notice this verse number two, he took 10 men of the elders of the city. These would become witnesses to whatever transaction was executed there at the city gate in these court settings. There were 10 witnesses that would witness this. And so if anything came up in the future, these 10 witnesses would be able to say, yes, that is true. We were there. We witnessed the transaction and so. Notice verse number three. Then he said to the Redeemer, notice the near of the kinsman is not even named here. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Verse number four tells us, so I thought I would tell you of it and say, now get the picture. Sometimes when you're reading through the Bible, I don't know about you, but I have to do things in vignettes, pictures. I get a picture of what's taking place. Here's a city gate. They're going to hold this court scene. There are elders there, and 10 of them are going to witness this scene. And Boaz is sitting at the gate, in through the gate walks someone who is a nearer Q 
kinsman, redeemer for Ruth and Naomi than Boaz is. So Boaz tells him to come sit and so. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it. Boaz says to the nearer kinsman redeemer, you need to purchase the land. Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If, if you will redeem it, redeem it. Now, Boaz is in love with Ruth. Boaz is anticipating that there is a nearer kinsman redeemer in the family of Naomi's husband, Elimelech's line, and that it's his rightful place to redeem this parcel of land, to keep it in the family, to keep the name going. And so Boaz says to this kinsman redeemer, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it. If you will redeem it. Notice in the rest of that verse. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. In other words, there weren't 15 other people in line that's a nearer kinsman redeemer than this one redeemer. He's the closest of kin. He can choose to redeem it. He can choose not to redeem it. And so Boaz is hoping, obviously, because he's in love with Ruth, that this nearer kinsman redeemer will reject this proposal here. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Notice verse number five. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, uh-oh, here's the second parcel to that. You're going to get Ruth that comes along with it. Now, the kinsman redeemer, the near one, was willing to redeem it, but he hadn't heard the rest of the story. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead. Her husband was Malon, the son of Naomi and Elimelech, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Verse number six, then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Boy, he quickly did not want what came along with it. Ruth, a Moabite. So he says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Verse number seven. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. Now, so get the picture. Here's Boaz. Here's the nearer kinsman redeemer. And so in order to make this transaction where the nearer kinsman redeemer says, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. What was he to do? I hope I don't have a hole in my sock. He takes off his shoe and hands it to Boaz to fulfill the transaction. It was a witness to the transaction of the nearer kinsman redeemer that he was making the transaction and that he was not going to fulfill the redemption in this situation. Notice uh, the rest of this verse says, so when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal, verse nine. 
Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and the Malon. And then the rest of verse 9 says, Also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Now, the law of the kinsman redeemer is given in the Old Testament. It's given in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 23 and 24. And then in the book of Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, there's the law that governs the Leverite marriage is found there. In other words, if one brother, if, uh, if a brother died and he left a wife and there were no children or whatever, he had to come in and take uh, the uh, brother's wife uh, so that there would be a lasting inheritance and the land would not be given to those outside of the family. So it was a mosaic law. It was laws under Moses, uh, the law of the kinsman redeemer in Leviticus and the law governing this Leverite marriage. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the purpose of these laws was what? It was to preserve the name and to protect the property, the land of the families in Israel. God owned the land. God didn't want the land exploited by rich people who would take advantage of poor people and of widows. And so the law was given for that reason, to protect the widowhood, and to protect the land. Now, when they obeyed these laws, it made sure that a dead man's family name did not die with him and that his property would not be sold outside of that tribe or that class. The tragedy is that the Jewish rulers didn't always obey the law. In fact, the prophets had to rebuke them for stealing land from those that were helpless. And we won't go into the background of all that, but you find that in 1 Kings 21, Isaiah uh, 5, 8 through 10, and Habakkuk 2, 9 through 12. So the nation's abuse of the land, Israel's abuse of the land was one of the reasons that they were taken into captivity according to 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and 21. Now, let's look at this what is the meaning of redemption? The word redeem means to set free by paying a price. In the case of Ruth and Naomi, Elimelech's property had either been sold or was under some kind of a mortgage and the rights to that land had passed to Ruth's husband who was deceased, Malon, when Elimelech died. And so this explains why Ruth was also involved in this transaction, but she was too poor. She couldn't redeem the land for herself. And when it comes to spiritual redemption, all people are in bondage to sin and to Satan and are unable to set ourselves free. Jesus Christ gave his life as our kinsman redeemer. Our ransom for sinners and faith in him sets the captive free. Now, in those Old Testament days, to be a kinsman redeemer, there had to be at least three qualified distinguishing marks. Number one, a kinsman redeemer, he had to be a near kinsman. Now, that would just go on down the line until they found the next near, nearest kinsman. Not everybody could perform this duty. Uh, he had to be a near kinsman, according to Leviticus 25, 25. 
Uh, and here was the major obstacle that Boaz had to overcome because there was another man in Bethlehem that was a near relative to Ruth than Boaz was. In this Old Testament picture, the Old Testament is filled with pictures of Christ. It reminds you that he had to become related to us to redeem us. What did God do? He became flesh and blood so he could die on the cross for our redemption. When he was born into the world in human flesh, Jesus became our kinsman redeemer. And he will remain our kinsman redeemer for all of eternity. So in order to qualify as a kinsman redeemer, number one, he had to be a near kinsman. Secondly, he had to be able to pay the redemption price. He had to be of means enough in order to be able to pay whatever the price was that had to be paid. Now, Ruth and Naomi were too poor to redeem themselves, but Boaz had all of the necessary resources to set them free. And so when it comes to the redemption of sinners in this world, nobody but Jesus Christ is rich enough to pay the price. Money can never set sinners free. It's the shedding of the precious blood of Christ that has accomplished redemption. We have redemption. How? Through Christ's blood because he gave himself for us and he purchased eternal redemption for the sinner. There was a third qualification to be a kinsman redeemer Number one, he had to be a near kinsman. Number two, he had to have the means to pay the price. Number three, he had to be willing to redeem. And as we see in these verses, the near kinsman was not willing to redeem Ruth. Oh, he was willing to redeem the land, but he wasn't going to take on Ruth. And so Boaz was free then to purchase both the property and a wife. The near kinsman had the money, but no motivation he was afraid he would jeopardize his own family's inheritance. Now, what was the method of redemption? In those ancient times, as I said, at the city gate was where the business transactions took place in the presence of others. And when Boaz arrived at the gate and he gathered those witnesses, those 10 witnesses to witness the transaction, transaction then the nearer kinsman walked in, and you know the rest of that story. The key theme to this little four-chapter book is of chapter four. The key theme in chapter four is redemption, to buy, to purchase. There are some contrast that we see in Boaz and the Lord Jesus Christ. Some commentaries talk about Boaz being a type of Christ in the Old Testament. There are some contrasts between Boaz and the Lord. Boaz purchased Ruth by giving out his wealth, while Jesus purchased his bride, the church, by giving himself on the cross. Boaz didn't have to suffer and die in order to get Ruth, his bride, Boaz had a rival in another kinsman redeemer, but there was no rival that challenged Jesus Christ. Boaz took Ruth that he might raise up the name of the dead, but we Christians glorify the name of the living Christ. There were witnesses on earth to testify that Ruth belonged to Boaz, but God's people have witnessed from heaven the spirit and the word. When Jesus finished purchasing his bride, he sat down in heaven because the transaction was completed when he said, take to lest die on the cross, it is finished. In chapter four, on this theme of redemption, we see the bridegroom and we see how the contrasts are there that we can 
speak about the Lord Jesus Christ in view of what's happening on this kinsman redeemer. But in verse number 11 and in verse number 12, we see the bride. That's the bridegroom, Boaz. Let's look at the bride. Chapter 11 and 12, we'll read these verses together. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, let me pause there. Those were Jacob's wives. Remember, O father Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. It would be through Rachel and Leah that we get the 12 sons of Jacob. Like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephratah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Remember that word, the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Tamar was not a very godly person, but I want you to know she's in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any of y'all got anybody in your genealogy you're not overly proud of? Hello? Most of us are afraid to go back too many generations. But notice, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so Ruth would be by divine sovereignty, by the providential watch care of God. He would choose Ruth to become the wife of Boaz. Little do you know whenever you begin the story of Ruth in chapters 1 and you follow it through, all of the intricacies of the sovereignty of Almighty God let me tell you if, you, if you haven't learned anything about sovereignty and God's providence from the book of Esther and Ruth, I don't know that I can make it any plainer. That God is in control. God is in charge. God is watching from a distance, yet he lives within the human heart of every believer. But God's providential watch care. God knows about tomorrow. He knows about last week, last year the past years of your life. He knows the future days of your life. He is sovereignly the one in control. And God, all over the world, he uses the good. He takes the bad and the ugly and can use them to benefit his, his elective eternal purposes for his program for this world. Now, if you don't know that, then you're spiritually and biblically uninformed. I read something today about one of the senators, and, and he was commenting and criticizing another one, saying he, he sure didn't know much about his Christianity, and I thought when I read his statement, well, you don't know much about the Bible yourself. You know, it's the pot calling the kettle black. And so uh, a, a lot of people know just enough about the Bible to be dangerous. But you know, the New Testament says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Now, let me stop here to say, had this situation not taken place right here, she's going to have a baby and that baby boy is going to be named Obed. And Obed will eventually have a son whose name will be Jesse. 
And Jesse will have a son whose name is David. You ever heard of him? Shepherd boy. And through David, through that lineage, the son of David, known as Jesus Christ, would come into the world. You see how God moves the pieces on the chessboard of life? It wasn't by accident. When the near kinsman redeemer walked into the city gate that day and the transaction was made, it wasn't by accident or happenstance that he checked out and said, no, I'm not willing. He takes off his shoe as uh, to confirm the transaction in the presence of the witnesses. It wasn't by accident that Ruth headed off into a field that she did not know whose it was to glean from. Little did she know God was moving the pieces of the chess board into places for his elective eternal purposes. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, Leah and Ruth, I mean Leah, And Rachel, where they're buried, oh, little town of Bethlehem, Jesus would be born there. When you think of that little place, and I think it was this year because of the war, Bethlehem didn't get to to, uh, celebrate a Christ child like they normally do in the past because of the days of war. I don't think it's by happenstance that you and I have been studying the book of Ruth and the book of Esther when we chose, I believe, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to study the book of Ruth and Esther. The third thing chapter 4 deals with in verse, uh, chapter 4, verses uh, 13 to 22, let's read it and look at the baby So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. I want you to think about that. Did those women... When they made that statement, blessed, that means happy, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. Little did they know then what we know now, that the Redeemer would be our kinsman Redeemer. It would be through this situation that the lineage of Christ that we are given in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, the lineage there of the Lord Jesus Christ. Little did they know when they said, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And let me tell you, not only did he not leave her without a redeemer, he did not leave us without a redeemer. When I think about that hymn, Blessed Redeemer up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior weary and warm. When I think about that, Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him from Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, dying and heeding, dying for me. Oh, it's so interesting. So many people leave out the Old Testament. But it's the Old Testament that brings revelation to us in the New Testament. Notice, if you will, verse 15. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. If you can only imagine, Naomi went out full when we first read the story. Remember, she, her husband, her two sons left Bethlehem, which means house of bread. It was a famine. Famine meant in that day that God was sending, uh, God was sending judgment for something the people had done. They go to a godless land, the land of Moab, stay 10 years. 
She loses all three members of her family, husband, two sons. She went out full, but when she returned, it said she returned empty. But I want you to notice here in this last chapter, he restores her. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, who this grandson by the name of Obed, Naomi would be the grandmother for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Verse 16 tells us, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. A grandmother and a little Obed together. Notice verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse followed David. You see, the genealogy that we are given there is so vitally important is because Jesus would be from the line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus, the Christ child, the Christ of Christmas that we sing about would come. No wonder he would be referred to as son of David. No wonder someday he will sit on the throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign for all eternity. I don't know about you, but the Moabites were not to enter the congregation of the Lord. According to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23 and 3, even to the 10th generation. But in the little book of Ruth, we close with a 10 generation genealogy that climaxes with the name of David don't ever underestimate the power of Almighty God. Amen. Would you stand as we pray together? Father God, as we go from this place this evening, I thank you for the book of Ruth, many but mighty. Thank you, God, for what we see and how that it gives us that genealogy to take us to where we are in our lives. What a wonderful book. What an outstanding message. Thank you that through the lineage of Obed to Jesse to David on down to the New Testament when Jesus would come, our kinsman redeemer, to pay the price on Calvary's cross, by the shedding of blood for the remission of our sins, so that we might through him know God and have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, thank you for these days, these studies, for what it has reflected and mirrored to us, what it has taught us, how hugely important these Old Testament stories are to give us a much better and broader picture of your holy word. Father, bless us in our days ahead as we continue to study and teach us, O oh God, that we might be able to reach out into our world and share this wonderful Christ of Christmas with those that are in desperate need and they don't even realize it. 
Father, take each one safely to their home tonight. Keep them safe. Return us back on Sunday, I pray. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. Looking forward to Sunday morning. We are getting back to what on earth is happening. And this Sunday is raptured out of 1 Thessalonians. So I hope you will be here Sunday morning.